Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm reviewing the very popular Canon RF 100-500 from the perspective of a wildlife photographer. I've personally owned this lens since 2021. I've used it in the field extensively for the last few years, and I'm gonna share with you all the amazing images that I've taken, plus plenty from my beautiful members. I'm gonna share the strengths, the weaknesses, I'm gonna answer all the common questions. So this review is very detailed, so I've broken it down into chapters. You can see those at the bottom of this video or down in the description. And for full disclosure, as I mentioned, I purchased this lens with my own money. Canon have no say over this review whatsoever. Okay, so let's have a chat about the actual lens itself. It's a brand new design for Canon's RF mount, so it will only work on Canon's RF mirrorless bodies. It's a 100 to 500 zoom range. That's an amazing focal length. We go from 100, to 500, so it's an external zoom. So at 100, it's quite small, and at 500, we zoom all the way out. This lens is an L series lens, which means it's Canon's premium lens range, and this replaces the EF 100 to 400 that we had on DSLRs that so many people love, and I'm sure many of you have that lens. The first thing you'll notice when picking this up is just the weight. It is absolutely incredible how Canon have created a 500 millimeter zoom range that only weighs 1,365 grams. That's without the hood or the collar. That weight means this is a lens you can handhold pretty much all day. It's extremely comfortable to use, and it is honestly game-changing to have a lens with this focal length at this weight. So Canon have released this graphic just to highlight that size and weight. And when we compare the two, you can see just how far Canon have come. You've basically got an extra 100 millimeters of focal length in the same size package that weighs less. So it's a full credit to Canon's engineers that have come up with this design. And when we compare it to the Sony 200 to 600, I don't know if you can see the difference there, but <laughs> there really is no comparison. Alrighty, so if we have a look at the actual side of the lens, there's a number of rings, there's a number of buttons, so let's go through them. The first one at the very front, that is our zoom ring. It's nice and big, so you can grab hold of it and turn it. The throw is probably middle of the range. It's not short and it's not long. It's just about right. Probably, if I'm in the field, let's it's one massive turn, really. So I prefer a shorter throw, but that's just personal preference. So that's nice and big, it feels good. It's just in and out, no drama whatsoever. The next ring, and this is a bit perplexing to me and I'm a bit confused by it. This ring here, it's hard to see because of this camo, but there's a smooth and tight ring. So what does that do? Well, when we turn it to tight, what that means is it's extremely hard to turn the zoom ring. Why does it have that? Well, the issue you have with this is it's got barrel creep when the lens, you hang it like this. Can you see that? The barrel just comes out all on its own. So just gravity forces the barrel to fall out. And you don't really want that when you're walking along, you've got this barrel constantly coming in and out. So if you turn this ring, we no longer have barrel creep. But if I'm being perfectly honest, that is a lot of real estate to assign to prevent barrel creep. When we look at the much, much cheaper 100 to 400, this doesn't really have barrel creep. But what they've done is they've got a switch on the side. It's got lock. So they just use a lock. You just hit lock and there's no barrel creep. That's a lot less real estate just having this switch than this ring. You might be thinking I'm being a bit picky but the reason I think it's a waste of real estate is this lens does not have any lens function buttons on it. So most of other modern lenses have these buttons now. So the Sony has it and these lens function buttons are extremely useful. So I would have preferred a lens function button to this tight, uh, smooth ring that we have. In terms of the switches, they're pretty standard for Canon. We've got autofocus, manual focus, we've got image stabilization, which is excellent. And of course, you've got your focal range here where you can limit it three meters to infinity for bird and flight or whatever you have. It is missing that feature I showed on the 100 to 300, which I love, and that's the focus preset um, distance or the recall. The ability to have a button on the side of the lens, which pulls back to a set focus range is just fantastic. And hopefully on future lenses, Canon would do that. I would have loved it to have been on here. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't have that feature. Uh, if we keep working back, we now have our manual focus override. And these Canon lenses, you can manually focus whilst in autofocus, which is fantastic. And I actually don't mind the position of this. So when I'm shooting, I'll go this way. When I'm shooting, I'm looking through. If it gets onto the background, I can just quickly touch this to pull us back. And when I'm shooting dragonflies or bird in flight, I'm often 
changing my focal plane manually to get the bird into subject and then I'm hitting the focus button. So I quite like the position of the manual focus ring. Then you'll see that we've got the foot and you'll notice that I've got an aftermarket foot on this. So I'll just quickly take it off and you'll so that you might be going, why do you have an aftermarket foot? So that's one benefit of this lens is you can take the collar off, which saves quite a bit of weight uh, if you're doing hand holding. But the original lens comes with this foot and I've mentioned it numerous times, it's highly annoying, but Canon do not have an Arca Swiss built into their foot. So you've got to put an additional plate if you want to use it on a gimbal or some sort of mount that has Arca Swiss. Buy these aftermarket collars, which actually have the Arca Swiss built into it. I would like this to be a bit longer to be fair, and it's not quite as smooth as the original. So that's a slight disappointment about this one. It could be just this one I've got, but it still works fine and I'm definitely using it because I prefer to have Arca Swiss. Um, again, I just take this off if I'm just hand holding, there's no real point for the tripod collar. All right, so I'll just leave that off to show you the last ring. And this is the control ring. I'm not sure if you can see it because of the camo, but we've got a ring right at the base of the lens. And I must admit, I find this a little bit awkward. Not quite as bad when the lens collar is not there, but when the lens collar is there, Get your hand to come back it just feels awkward being at the base and this you have this ring here for exposure compensation or aperture or whatever it is it's just another ring and it's very good to have that ability but i'm not too keen on the placement and again if i go back to the rf 100 to 400 they have it in a completely different place they have theirs at the end of the lens that's traditionally where a lot of canon control rings are but i think i prefer it at the end of the lens as opposed to right up but again personal preference just something you've got to deal with or live with if you have this lens. In terms of the actual uh, lens hood, thankfully it does come with this lens hood and this lens hood does have this inspection port on the side of it. I think that's to turn a variable ND filter or an ND filter if you've got that. Alrighty, that leads us onto the price of this lens. It's a little bit eye-watering, I must admit. The retail price in the US is $2,899. Any way you look at that, it's a big investment. It's a large chunk of change. And unfortunately, that might, puts it out of reach of a lot of people, which is disappointing. Be aware that Canon do often offer discounts on this lens. At the moment, July 2023, they've got cash back in lots of different markets. I think it's $200 off in the US, maybe $400, 450 in the UK. Even Australia has had some sort of discounts as well. So the biggest complaint I hear from people is, this lens is so much more expensive than the Sony and the Nikon. And you're correct. This Sony retails in the US for around 2000. That new Nikon is unbelievably, I think around 1700 US. I paid 2050 for this lens on sale in Australia. Comparatively, I paid 4300 for this one on sale. So this lens was half the price of this. But I don't think it's a fair comparison. And I'll explain exactly why. With lenses, most manufacturers have a pro level or a premium level of lens and then an affordable tier under that. So with Canon, we have L series as their top. So for example, this is an L series lens and this one isn't, this is their lower level. With Sony, they have G Master and then the level under that. Nikon have S line and then a level under that. Olympus have their pro and then a level under that. When we compare it to this Sony 600 and the um, Nikon 600, these are both not premium level lenses. They're the tier underneath. So this is not a G Master lens. And that's where our pricing comes into play. And it's quite easy to look at this because Nikon have their 100 to 400, which is a premium lens. And that lens retails for 2,700 in the US, only slightly cheaper than this one. Their Nikon 180 to 600 is 1700. So even within Nikon, you've got a thousand dollars difference between their 100 to 400 and their 600 millimeter zoom range. So unfortunately for us Canon shooters, we simply don't have an affordable 600. And that is a justifiable complaint. And that's the big issue. So I agree that this is an expensive lens, but we need to compare it to the premium 100 to 400s from Sony and Nikon. And when we do that, it's only slightly more expensive. It's quite comparative to those. And if I'm being honest, I would prefer this 100 to 500 over those 100 to 400. I just prefer that 100 millimeters extra reach. Now, it's also important that I state that just because this Sony is not a G Master doesn't mean this is a bad lens. In fact, I think this is an incredible lens with exceptional image quality 
for not being a G Master. So another way to determine whether a lens is a worthy investment is to speak to existing owners of that lens. And that's what I've done. I reached out to my beautiful members who own this lens and I asked them to send me their favorite images and what they think of the lens. And I wanna start with member Tom. Now Tom sent me some beautiful images and a wonderful story and I wanna share that with you. So Tom has been trying to capture a bearded tit in the reeds for a long time. And he has a big 600 millimeter prime lens, similar to my 500. The image quality of it is exceptional. However, those big lenses are quite hard and cumbersome to move around, especially if the subject's moving quickly. And he struggled to get a shot. However, he invested in this lens, he's gone back to that same location, and he's photographing this spared tit, and to his surprise, this lens tracked that subject extremely well, and the birds popped up onto the reed, he's hammered away on the shutter, and he captured his favorite shot of this species today. And I love this shot. I love the framing, I love the colors, I love the habitat just everything about it. And in Tom's words, he said, I know from experience, I would never have managed this shot without the lens. The eye tracking was just so quick, even with distracting obstacles. Um, and that's just fantastic. Now, the next member who shared her story, and I was very um, happy to read it, was Madeline. Now, Madeline actually started with the 100 to 400, but she invested in this 100 to 500. And this story is very heartwarming. She's gone on a holiday to Maine, and she was walking through the main street. She's noticed a wildlife photographer's shop. She's gone in there, sparked up a conversation, and then they've decided to go out together. He was very kind to share his knowledge and his location. And a shout out to Nick um, Ledley, is it? I'm not sure how to pronounce the surname, but big shout out to Nick for assisting her. They've gone out on kayaks and using this lens and this camera, she has spotted a loon. The weather was beautiful, the light was fantastic, her low angle, she's captured this stunning shot. I love the wing spread, I like the detail. And in her words, she said, when I upgraded to the 100 to 500, I was blown away by the sharpness of the lens, even all the way out at 500. I found that getting creative with my angles, I was able to achieve clean backgrounds, even at 7.1. So a great story and just more evidence of the quality of this lens. Now, the next member who sent in some shots was Jim Price, and he sent me the shot of a pair of great horned owls. There's lots to like about this shot, and I love that second bird peeking from behind. It really lifts the image. It's nice and sharp, full of detail. Jim tells me he uses this lens on both his R7 and his R5, and he gets great shots with both cameras. And I've talked about the sharpness and the detail quite a bit, but this next image just takes it up to another level. And that's by Thomas. He sent me this beautiful blue throat singing. The level of detail and sharpness is just incredible. And it was always his dream to get this shot, and he was very happy to capture it. Another image which showcases this lens is this beautiful kingfisher with a little fish by member Michael Paul. He was absolutely stoked to get this. I would be, I wish I had that image in my collection. And the next shot by member Dan Betty definitely highlights this lens. He loves chasing warblers around during that migration period. He likes the weight of this lens and he's captured this, what's it called, a chestnut sided warbler in its habitat. I love the framing in this, the details, fantastic. I love the singing pose. Overall, a wonderful shot that Dan's very happy with, and I can see why. And Dan said even though he owns a lot of Canon lenses, he often finds himself going for this one just because of its size and its weight and the ability to wander around just photographing what he sees. And another member who photographs in exactly the same fashion as Dave. Dave said he wanted a lens that was light enough to take on his walks, but gave him 500 millimeters. This one hit that brief and he takes it on his morning walks. And he went out in a pretty gloomy morning. Many of us would just leave our big lenses at home, but he's got his little lens with him. He's wandering around and then all of a sudden the sun has come up creating this beautiful color and glow. He's heard a sparrow singing from a branch. He's obviously lined it up, hand held, taken a shot and we can see that this shot just sort of encapsulates the morning. We've got the fog, we've got the birds singing. And the only reason he got this shot because he had the camera with him. And isn't that often the way? We have to get lucky by getting out. And if we don't have the camera with us, we can't take shots like that. So the ability to just hand hold this and carry it because of its weight, it can't be underestimated. And another member who's used this lens extensively is member Graham. He did a big trip around Australia. I'm very jealous of that. And he got to see a lot of cool birds. And the photo that he shared was of this red-tailed black cockatoo. We've got a very Australian scene here. We've got the eucalypt. We've got the nice colored rock in the background. The detail is just exceptional. I'm very jealous. I wish I had that image. So well done, Graham. 
And just in Graham's words, he said he wanted a light lens and he said he wanted a lens for an older, mature aged person to carry for extended periods. And he reports he's taken this lens on walks of between five and 10 kilometers without issue. And one thing that made me a bit humble and uh, very happy is the number of people that said they've only recently got into wildlife photography and they've found my channel very helpful. So thank you for that. I'm very appreciative. But one member who's relatively new is Russ. He's picked up this lens. He's gone out into the field. He's had a red fox come up towards him. He probably couldn't believe it. And he's photographing this beautiful red fox. And this is the result. We've got wonderful eye contact. It's a beautiful portrait, lovely colors. And it's these type of shots when we're starting out that get us hooked and keep us going forever, I think. Now, me personally, I've taken a lot of images with this of all sorts of different species and different varieties. And I'll share a few of those with you now. First one is this red cat robin. I've shared numerous times, but it's my favorite shot with this lens. I just love the wing spread. The detail's fantastic. Out of focus background. And then we can go from birds and then we can do dragonflies. And I managed to get these two dragonflies mating. This was actually taken on the R7, which gives us a little bit more field of view. And the detail again is just fantastic. The autofocus worked really well to pick up these dragonflies. Now we can go from these tight portrait types shots and then we can zoom out to 100 or 200 and we can get these habitat shots. And I got these two kangaroos sharing a kiss. We've got all that habitat there. It's just amazing that flexibility to go from 100 to 500. And then if we want to do macro style shots, I've took this photo of a honeybee on a red flower, a native Australian flower and the detail is just fantastic. And whilst I'm not a sports photographer, I did get invited to photograph at a motorcycle day, and I just took this lens along with me, and I had a lot of fun. The autofocus was fantastic at tracking those motorbikes, but the range just enabled me to go in and out depending on how big the motorcycle was, and we got a shot of this Harley Davidson banking around a corner, which the owner was very, very happy with. And the last image I want to share is a landscape image. I'm no landscape photographer, but I believe this focal length is quite attractive to a number of landscape photographers and I actually captured this shot one morning. It reminded me of Mordor from Lord of the Rings. I just think the color here, the red is just so vibrant and the blacks are very black. Again, this was just shot handheld from my front yard as the sun was coming up. I think what you can get from all these images, both mine and from my members, is just the versatility of the lens. It's like an all-rounder, I guess. It enables you to do just about everything. And one member who showcased this was member Edward. He shared this photo of a bear feeding on a fish, which is just fantastic. I don't know how close you were to get this shot, but he's gone from that environment, capturing that shot into his backyard and going macro style and capturing a fly. So here's one lens that's captured two completely different images. And in his email, he did say that's the one thing he loves. He said, someone like me that loves all genres, this is sort of one lens I always reach for that enables me to do all those things. So, so far I've been very complimentary about the lens and that's because it's possibly the best light zoom lens that I've used. However, it does have some weaknesses and it's only fair that we share those. And the first one for me anyway was 500 millimeters on a zoom lens is quite short when we're using a full frame body like the R6 or the RP or even the R5. I'm used to using 700 millimeters. So I usually use 500 plus a 1.4. So I'm usually at 700. So as soon as I look through this, the subject's just way smaller. And you can see this comparison from my 700 prime to this 500. I think you need to be realistic. I'm, I'm sure many of you have probably got this lens thinking, oh, 500 millimeters, that's gonna make the subject massive. And then you look through the viewfinder and you're probably a little bit surprised and maybe a bit disappointed that the subject's not bigger. You just have to be realist that 500 millimeters, especially on the zoom lens, isn't as big as you'd like. And with small subjects, they're gonna be small in the frame. Is that an issue? Yes and no. Um, on the positive side, it enables us to have a lot more habitat in our shots. And this is a good thing. This shot of a superb fairy wren, I couldn't get much closer. The bird's quite small. However, when we zoom in, it's nice and sharp, but now we have this nice habitat scene and we've got all of the different reeds in the shot. And then we look at this magpie shot. Love this magpie. We've got all that habitat there. It just helps build a story. And I have to credit these zoom lenses for completely changing my photography. For years and years, I just used a prime. I had the subject big, the background completely out of focus, and I started to get a little bit bored. But with these zoom lenses, I'm now extremely creative. I can change my focal length. I can change my composition, uh, try and include that habitat. So I actually think it's more of a strength than a weakness, but it's just something you need to be aware of. 
If you do want to increase the size of the subject, there's a couple of ways we can do that. The first way is just to crop it, and cropping will enable the subject to be bigger. It's easier on a big megapixel body like the R5. For example, I took this shot of a Fuscus honey eater flying, and in the raw shot, we can see the birds quite small, but by cropping in, the bird's now bigger, and it still maintained a lot of detail. Or we can use a APS-C body like the R7 that has a 1.6 crop factor. It makes our field of view go from 100 to 500 to 160 to 800, and that's a great field of view. It's almost perfect, to be honest, and I do love using this lens on the R7. It just makes that subject much, much bigger. And I managed to capture this turquoise parrot on my property. As you can see in the raw file, even with 800 millimeters field of view, the subject was quite small. But I managed to crop it, and we ended up with this final image, which I'm very happy with, and it's gone straight into the collection. So the image quality that you're going to get from this lens is not an issue. The only times you'll run into problems is if the subject's too small or you're in low light. If you've got nice light and you can get close, no issue whatsoever with the image quality out of this. Now, the final way to get extra reach is by using converters. And I'm happy to report that you can use both the two times and a 1.4 converter with this lens. Now, Canon have created this nice graphic which demonstrates the focal lengths that we now have. And you'll quickly notice that one major flaw with this lens, and it's an engineering fail of a high degree, is when we start using converters, we lose the 100 to 300 range. And it is, oh, it's a bugbear of mine. It's so annoying. So the actual issue is, is when we're at 100 millimeters, there's an element that comes right to the back of the lens. And as you can see on the 1.4, we've got this bit that protrudes. And this simply cannot go in there because it's going to hit the glass that's already in the, the lens. So when we zoom out to 300 millimeters, that element has moved forward, which enables us to then stick this in. So now we can attach the 1.4. Now we have the 1.4 in. And when we try to retract the lens, that's as far as we can go. So this is now the shortest the lens can go. We, and it's just, oh, it's just frustrating because now it makes this lens much, much bigger. Like if you want to pack it away or if you want to leave the 1.4 on, you have to use it at this size. And look, that's just a bit of a bummer. And when we look at the range now with a 1.4 converter, we lose the range of 140 to 420 millimeters, which is a real shame and takes away the benefit or the feature of this lens. And if we if we were to use the two times, we now go to 600 to 1000. So 1000 is definitely nice. That's a lot of focal length. We do lose a bit of light. We lose one stop with the 1.4 and we lose two stops with the two times, which makes it very difficult to use in anything but the best of light. And I guess the other thing to consider with extenders is it raises your cost even higher. Like these are five or 600 US, a thousand Australian, on top of the already expensive lens, this now in Australian money is looking at five and a half thousand dollars for this setup, which is just incredible. However, I have taken lots of good shots with 1.4. Your IQ will drop slightly. However, I've taken numerous good shots with it. I know many of you have as well. The first one is this golden-headed cysticula. I just love this framing of this. I like the color. I like the feel of it. Overall, just looks fantastic. And that was taken at 700 millimeters. And next is the two times. And I'll be honest, I didn't really use the two times all that much. F14, you've really started to stretch that light gathering ability of the lens and the AF and the IQ does take a hit, but it's definitely possible if you really want that extra reach, you can use this two times. I took a few shots with the two times. The first one was this headshot of a grebe. Nothing wrong with the detail there. Again, I had good light, but I did get a lot less keepers when using the extenders than without them. But I just want to reiterate again, when you start using these converters, you're going to need a lot of light. Otherwise, you're going to end up with very low shutter speeds or very high ISO. I've already spoken about aperture a few times, but that's probably one of the other major complaints people have with this lens, is its max aperture without a converter is f7.1, which makes it a little bit slower. It's definitely slower than, say, your 5.6 lenses or even your 6.3 lens. What does that actually mean? It all has to do with how much light gathering ability that these lenses have. And I've been using a window analogy recently, and I'll use it again. So we start with a really big window, letting in lots of light. Now, the next aperture is f4, which is one stop slower, and that now lets in half the amount of light. And then we go to 5.6, which is one stop again, lets in half the amount of light. 
But then when we go from 5.6 to 6.3, it's actually only one third of a stop. And then we go from 6.3 to 7.1, which again is a third of a stop. So the difference between 6.3 and 7.1 isn't all that big. It's basically like going from 1 80th of a shutter speed to 1 60th of a shutter speed. That's the difference. So it's not major and it's not as big as a lot of people make out. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I haven't had really any major issues with 7.1. Had to make it 7.1, otherwise it just would have been a lot bigger and a lot heavier. And this lens is sharp at 7.1, which is fantastic. Alrighty, it's time to compare some lenses and you can see a few in front of me here. First, we've got Sony's 200-600, the 100-500 and Canon's RF 100-400. And you can see how they differ in size. And that's probably the biggest difference is these zooms are just much smaller than the 600 millimeter zooms. And when it comes to the weight, You've got to be careful because manufacturers are a little bit sneaky in how they do their specs. They always give you the weight of just the lens alone without any hood and without any collar in this one. So what I'll do is at the bottom of the screen, I'm going to put the different weights. Working weight to me is with a lens hood and the collar. So the working weight of the Sony is about 2.4 kilos, which makes it quite heavy. The working weight of this Canon 100 to 400 is actually quite a bit lighter because we can take the collar off. And if you're just shooting handheld, we don't have to have that weight. So, the, so this lens with just the lens hood without the collar is about 1.4 kilos. So it's about a kilo lighter than this lens. And that is significant, especially if you're out in the field all day carrying these hand, shooting handheld, one kilo is massive. And then we come down to this Canon lens and this is so light, it's kind of ridiculous. It's the lightest lens I own. It's absolutely fantastic. So if weight is your only concern, this one has it in spades. Now, in terms of its length and its size, its retracted size is obviously quite short. And when we ex fully extend the Canon, it is actually quite long once we get out to that 500 millimeters. We've got lens hoods on here. Now, I just can't emphasize enough the difference in the weight, especially when you're out in the field. And of course, this will vary from person to person depending on your strength. This one's just gonna be a lot less taxing than this one. And in all fairness, I can shoot in the field handheld with this, and I've done it a number of times, so it's not a real issue for me. I can handhold this lens. However, this one's just obviously a lot easier and you can do it without your arms tiring so much. The next big advantage that we get with this lens is the fact that we can go to 100 millimeters. The difference between 100 millimeters and the 200 millimeters, that's the minimum on this one, is enormous. It's such a vast difference. Here's one at 100 millimeters, here's one at 200 millimeters. It's just night and day. So this one will enable much better landscapes and much wider shots. You might be saying, well, it doesn't really matter. You can just step backwards. Well, I've got one example to show you and it just so happened I was in the field with my good mate, Jan. He was shooting with the 100 to 500 and I was shooting with the 200 to 600. We had a family of Cape Barren geese. There was the mum, dad, two little chicks and Jan was able to get the entire scene in with the background and capture this absolutely magical shot. However, because I had 200, I couldn't get the same framing. And so I thought, I'll just go backwards. I've gone backwards, but because they were sort of down a cliff, I lost them. I pretty much just lost the shot. I could not take the same shot because I was that focal distance. I was just way too narrow. So that is a massive advantage. You can crop this to 600, but you can't crop this out to 100 if that makes sense. So in terms of its wide end, this one has it in spades. Now the other big difference between these two lenses is the minimum focus distance. This one is extremely good at, I think it's 900 millimeters. It just means you can get very close and take macro style shots. I think the maximum magnification is 0.33. When we compare it to the Sony, I think this one's 0.20. It's not bad, but at 2.4 meters minimum focus distance, you can just get much, much closer with this lens than you can with this one. And to show you just how close you can get, uh, member John Clark actually sent me in this image of a kookaburra that he's taken extremely close. Just check out those massive eyes on that bird and that minimum focus distance definitely gives you that advantage when it's coming to those styles of shots. So as you can see, there's a number of advantages to this Canon lens, but there's one area where it doesn't really compete with these and that's the focal length and the speed. This lens is clearly 600 millimeters. This is 500. 600 is always gonna make that subject bigger. This is maximum aperture of 6.3. This is 7.1. So we can't escape that. This will always have that advantage. And considering the price, it makes this much better value if you're looking for just photographing small birds or you want the subject as big as possible. Now, what difference does that make in the field? 
field. How different is 500 to 600? Well, I took this comparison shot, Gary the Galar, and you can see that the 600 is just bigger. And when we measure the ruler, this one was about 21 inches wide, and this one was about 24 inches. So you can see that we had a difference of about three inches in this scenario. However, a lot has to do with the body that you are using. And for the example, with this one, I was using the Canon R5, which is 45 megapixels. And on the Sony, I was using the 33 megapixel A7 4. So when I actually zoom in, they're virtually identical in size because of the extra megapixels the Canon offered. However, of course, if I was using a higher megapixel Sony body like the A1 or the A7R Mark V, the subject would obviously be much bigger with the Sony. This leads me to one of the biggest differences that I've encountered in the field using the Canon and the Sony, and that was the use of extenders. I've already mentioned how this lens loses the 100 to 300 range, and it's extremely annoying. The Sony does not. So you can use a 1.4 on the Sony and you get the full range. So when I put a 1.4 on this lens, it becomes a 280 to 840 f9. That is an enormous range of focal length. And when we put the 1.4 on this one, it becomes a 420 to 700 f10. And we can also see when we do a comparison with this at 700 millimeters and this at 840 millimeters, the difference is even more pronounced. And in terms of the light, yes, this is one third faster, but I honestly don't really see that as a huge advantage. One third is next to nothing really out in the field, and these bodies handle that higher ISO, not an issue. So overall, what this comparison shows me is these are two different lenses for two very different use cases. If you want a very versatile lens that does everything that doesn't weigh a lot, then this is a clear winner. However, if small birds is your game and you want as much reach as possible and you don't mind the weight and size, this is the clear winner at a much better price. And I guess this again just raises that entire issue of Canon not having a lens that can compete with this. And I'm with you. I wish we had it. The only way we're probably going to get it is either third party or maybe Canon will release a crazy lens like a 300 to 700 or something like that. But I'm not sure we will get a direct comparison anytime soon from Canon, which is a shame. But as I mentioned in my last review, we can't use the Sony lens, so we can't use that on Canon. So what options do we have? Well, we have the 100 to 500, which I've already mentioned is an extremely good lens. Then we have this 100 to 400, which is extremely affordable at 650 US, often goes on sale for 500. I love this lens. It is a little bit short at 400. You can actually put a 1.4 on this. Of course, that increases the cost quite a bit, but this doesn't have an issue with the converters. This allows the converters, so you go 140 to 560, I think it is, but it is f11, So, but that's quite a nice range. I did capture lots of nice shots using this combination. I got this beautiful Azure Kingfisher, which I'm very, very happy with. One final option that a lot of people are doing is actually just going with a prime and a zoom. So what they're doing is they're buying the affordable 100 to 400, and then they're buying the 800 f11, and just using them for whatever subjects you're doing. If you're doing small birds, grab the 800. If you want a versatile walk around, you grab this one. And these two lenses, the 800 and the 100 400, together are cheaper than this lens is on its own. So definitely worthwhile look option, looking into these more affordable options from Canon. And of course you can use an R7 on this, which gives you even a narrower field of view. Remember Matt did this. He photographed this very cool, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, is Eastern Toei on his R7. Beautiful bird, very cool subject. So that's definitely another option for you. The last zoom lens worth comparing is the Canon EF 100-400 version 2. A magnificent lens. I know many of you have that. It is quite expensive new now, but you can pick that up secondhand at a more affordable price. And that lens is fantastic. It works well on the RF body. So you can put a 1.4 converter, an EF1, and that will work well. You don't have any issues with the teleconverter and you get that same range, but it's a little bit faster. So you get 140 to 560 F8. So that's definitely an option if you can't afford this lens here. All right, we're getting through it. And next, I just want to talk about the autofocus. And as you would expect, the autofocus on this lens is fantastic. It's super fast. It's accurate and it's enabled me to capture some absolutely stunning shots. It obviously uses a very good fast AF motor. Pair that with Canon's eye tracking and you've got an excellent combination. It's not infallible. It's not perfect. The first shot I want to share with is a dragonfly in flight. So I was very fortunate that I had some dragonflies hovering over an outlet of a dam. And so they weren't flying crazily. They were sort of hovering around this one spot, which made it a bit easier. And I've just sat there and how I do it is I use the manual focus first. I look through the viewfinder. I'm 
turn the manual focus ring until I can see the dragonfly. I then engage the autofocus, then it usually goes to it, and then I track it and take some shots. If I was to just purely hit the autofocus, often it would just go to the background and it would lose the subject and it'd be very difficult. So I found I had to use the manual focus, but once it locked onto the subject, it did a really good job. And if we look at the final photo, I'm extremely happy with the great detail, great action, and that was captured with this lens. I would have struggled to do that with my big prime. It would have been just probably too heavy and slightly too difficult. So um, definitely gives us that ability. Now, it's like most mirrorless bodies, it can still jump onto the background, it can still miss the focus, it can still grab branches and grass. I think one of the errors we have with these reviews is a lot of us on YouTube will say the autofocus is amazing, it's fantastic, and show you all these examples, and then you grab it, you try it, and you struggle with it because it just keeps jumping on the wrong thing. So I want you to understand that the autofocus is not perfect, even with this lens, it will still jump on random things, and it's on us as photographers to use spot autofocus and or then eye tracking to stay on the subject. So we still have to have a bit of user input. The camera can't do it all for us. Um, but in regards to tracking the subject once it's on it, it's very, very good. And just to show you how good the autofocus is, I've got a couple of images from my members which blew me away. The first one is probably one of my favorite, and this is from member Thomas again. He managed to capture this frog as it was jumping out of the water, grabbing a dragonfly. I don't know how long this took to take or the skill to take it, but it's just awesome. You must have been on the dragonfly and maybe noticed the frog and just hammered away at the shutter as the frogs come up and we captured this. The detail's fantastic. The action's amazing. Well done. I love that shot. So the next shot is by member Rhett. He managed to capture this heron as it was flying across the water and I love how the wings are trailing through the water and obviously he's managed just to track that with the autofocus, um, getting him that photo. And one last photo from member Yurka. She managed to photograph some lapwings that do all these acrobatics in the sky, flying around. And she said the autofocus picked up the bird, tracked it, and enabled her to get this interesting flight shot. So overall, extremely good. Now I did whack on the two times and film the autofocus with some ducks. And you can see that it actually does pretty well, even in very low light. So the fact we can autofocus at F14 on a mirrorless body is incredible considering we couldn't even focus past f8 on the dslrs and you can see it just tracks it i've gone to the background i've then hit autofocus and it goes to the duck it's really good it's not perfect but I'm, I'm very happy with the autofocus and I have no issues whatsoever with this lens. And of course, this lens has Canon's image stabilization, which is just fantastic. I think it's six stops with the IBIS. Either way, when you look through the viewfinder, it's very, very steady. And because it's a bit lighter, it's a lot easier to keep steady and hold, which will lead to much lower shutter speeds. Now, if you followed the channel, you know I shake a lot when I shoot and Yarn, my mate, gives me a hard time, but I struggle. So for me, anything under, I don't know, 1 400th is probably a bit risky. But what I did was I shot at very slow shutter speeds just to see how low I could go. And I actually shot at 1 20th of a second. I just photographed the Scarlet Robin, and to my surprise, I got a number of shots that were sharp. And this one here is sharp. So 1 20th, I think 1 50th would probably be um, a better option. And I'm not sure why you'd want to go that low. I guess if you're in a rainforest and you really want to keep that ISO low. And in regards to the video, because it's so light, it's actually a really good lens for video shooting. There's still a bit of movement for me. However, once I put it into post, put a stabilizer on it, you can hardly tell. It's very, very steady footage. So I've shot quite a bit of video with this lens. And again, very, very happy. Well, if you've made it this far, thank you. Overall, this is one of the best zoom lenses I have ever used. The strength of course, it's Autofocus is very fast, it's IBIS is great, it's extremely sharp, it's very light, it's very versatile. It can just, jack of all trades, do just about everything. Of course that comes with a premium and its price is always going to be an issue for a lot of people. And the downside to that is just people not being able to afford it and enjoy it. Of course we have the 100 to 400 as an option and that is a great lens. However, the people that have bought this lens are overwhelmingly happy with it. I'm yet to meet someone, as I mentioned, that doesn't like this lens, and that's a true testament to it. Do I wish we had more focal length? Do I wish we had this on Canon? 100% I do. I'd love to have a longer focal length option available for us. Am I happy I bought this lens? Yes, I am. I'm very happy with it. It's going to stay in my collection. It goes side by side with my big prime, 
and I'm happy to take this out in the field. Now I think it's important that I state if you're considering buying this lens, just remember 500 millimeters may be a little bit short. This lens isn't gonna drastically improve your photos if you're not getting good light and getting close to your subject. You've gotta get it in the field, practice, practice, practice. Once you do that with this lens though, your images will look fantastic. This will assist you in your journey. It's just not gonna be a magic bullet, so to speak. What I'd love from existing owners is jump down into the comments and give us your mini review of the lens. What do you like, what don't you like? And again, I'm sure there's gonna be lots of comments referencing the Sony and the Nikon, and I'm free for you to do that. This discussion is good. Hopefully it'll help Canon to create their own 600 millimeter zoom lenses. All right, and before I sign off, I just wanna let you know that there's gonna be some more member images at the end of this video. Thanks again to all the members that submitted their images. Sorry if I didn't share your image. If you want the opportunity of having one of your images in one of my future videos, perhaps you could consider becoming a member yourself. What's a member? Well, for the price of less than a coffee per month, you can join the channel, you get a cool little emoji next to your name in the comment section. You get access to a 2023 digital calendar. And of course you support me to make future content like this. And I'm very grateful for that. So enjoy these next images and thanks again. Happy birding, take care, see you later. Mm -hmm.